Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your love and your goodness. Lord, thank you that you are going to speak to us and we're not going to be the same after your word changes our lives. Father, make us yours. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Why don't you open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4, and 1 John's toward the back end of, of your Bible, if you're looking for that. 1 John chapter number 4. I'm going to bring you a message today uh, in our Amen series called Define Love. Define Love. Let's figure out what love really is, okay? Let's understand what love is. And so we're going to, in order to do that, we're going to start in 1 John chapter number 4, verse number 7. While you're turning over there, let me tell you about our series, what we're talking about here at War Hill right now. We're talking about phrases and words and, and, and scriptures that we quote in church all the time, and people normally when they hear those things, they say, amen. And the reality is they don't understand what all of those mean. They don't understand what all of those are. And so we began this series, and I don't even think we understand what that word amen means. We've been talking about that for a few weeks. That's not, doesn't mean, okay, it's over, the end. What it means is, let it be so, let it become a reality in my life, so that if you hear a verse that you want to embrace in your life, what do you say? Amen. If you want the pastor to hurry up and preach faster, what do you say? Amen. And not with so much joy, come on now. All right. But that's what we do. We say amen, which means let it become a reality in my life. Now, the phrase that I'm going to bring you today is actually a phrase that I hadn't planned on putting in this series. Somebody taught this to me, and so now I'm going to teach it to you guys. And it, it was so, uh, uh, so shook my life and my view that I thought, okay, we need to put this in our sermon series. 1 John chapter number 4, verse number 7 reads like this. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another... For love comes from God. And anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. Now we have to think about that for just a moment. Because we know a lot of people who want nothing to do with God, but yet they express love for people. So what's that saying? So we need to read the rest of the concept here. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And so what we're hearing there is a passage that's saying, look, if you don't have love in your life, you're not really serving God. If you don't have love in your life, you can't be a mean Christian. Amen. How many of you are ready for that to become a reality in your life? I said you can't be a mean Christian Amen. because God is love. And God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. For this is one of my favorite scriptures. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Isn't God good to us? He's so good to us. You know, before we take a look at the phrase I want us to talk about today, I, I just want just a brief moment of some help today. Uh, can you help me define love? Can you help me define love? Somebody give me a word, one word, two words, what love is. Somebody. Kindness, sacrifice, respect, patient, forgiveness, compassion, gentleness. Uh-oh, we're getting the fruit of the Spirit here. Awesome, we're getting there. So we've got all these words that are describing love. Can I tell you that in these, these descriptions of love, it's really what we're looking for. We're looking for patience. We're looking for kindness. We're looking for the product of these things, but that really doesn't give me the definition of what love really is. It doesn't give me the understanding of what love is. And ultimately, and as in the last service, somebody called out and gave this answer, because in church you're almost always going to hear this phrase, that when I say define love, they'll quote from 1 John chapter 4, and they'll say this, that God, uh-oh, help me, what? God is love. That's the ultimate definition of love is God. But the problem with this is, how many of you have ever felt like maybe God didn't really love you sometimes? And see, the world has a hard time understanding that and justifying that because they don't understand why, if God is love, why do some things that he does not seem very loving? 
Why are some things that he does, why do they, they, they go against what I really want? And, because, and the reality for that is we have a kind of a mixed up understanding of what love is. Because we want to say, well, God is love, but we don't understand what that means. So then if you're in church, somebody always says, well, well, you know, pastor, we have to, let me just tell you, if you have to try to sound spiritual, you are not. Okay? But they, they get that voice and go, well, pastor, oh. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is not a definition of love. It, however, 1 Corinthians 13 describes what love does. But it doesn't define it. It doesn't define what love really is. Now, think about this for a moment. Well, you said, well, love, Pastor, is hard to define because love is a feeling. Oh, I feel love. We always say it doesn't make me feel this way. Well, if love were a feeling that it could not be demanded, and God demands love. You see, you can't demand a feeling. I know some of you that's a little hard to understand, but you can't demand a feeling. Some of you may have been guilty of saying something like this at some point in your life. You're going to do this, and you're going to like it. Let me, let me say this. You're going to eat your Brussels sprouts, and you're going to enjoy them. Now think about that for just a moment. That's not... The way it works, you can make me do an action, but you cannot make me feel good about that action. Because how many of you would just be thrilled if, if you had to eat your Brussels sprouts today? Anybody? About 20% of you. I'm going to tell you, if your family cooked Brussels sprouts the way my wife cooks Brussels sprouts, you'd be like, can we have more? But most of us realize that you can make me do something, but you can't make me feel the way you want me to feel about it. So if God demands us to have love, then it can't be a feeling. So in our attempts to find out these things, we have to understand, in order to be commanded then, love has to be an action or a decision. In order really to know what love is, it has to be an action or a decision. So when someone says that they love you, it has to involve certain characteristics. But here's the problem. We in our American mindset have a really messed up concept of what love is. Because the concept in the American mindset of what love is, if you love somebody, you'll do certain things for them. If you love somebody, you'll you'll act a certain way. And many, many young people, many, many children would even say that I feel loved when my parents buy me whatever it is. That this is how I feel loved. When somebody buys me something. And so the reason for that is we get guilty because we're gone too much, we work too much, we're not attentive enough, or we're spending too much time doing this. So we want our kids to feel loved, so we buy them a pacifier too. Oh, (laughs) sorry, just waiting on that one. We want them to feel loved too, so we buy them gifts. And the messed up side of that is we end up equating love with gifts, and gifts do not define love. And so it really gets us in on this wrong concept. And when we allow gifts to define love, the problem with that is by giving someone defines love, that means I also have to become performance-based because maybe if I do good enough, they'll love me. Maybe if I succeed enough, but our, our drive for success is really a drive to find love. And so we end up creating this culture that defines love as gifts and performance. And it's huge. It's a problem. The reason that's a problem is we teach our children, if I love you, I give you what you want. I want everybody to see I love my kids, so I want them to have whatever they want. So I give them gifts, and then we want our kids to thrive. And because if our kids are thriving, then people will see how much love we really have in our family, no matter how much we're faking it. But we end up with this concept of gifts and performance being what defines love. So we have these kids grow up who think gifts and performance, and they end up young adults, and they're still trying to find their way. And as they're still trying to find their way, they end up in a relationship. They probably have no business being in a relationship. And they say to them, I love you. Do you love me? And they go, oh, yes, I love you. And they say, well, if you love me, then what are you going to give me? And how are you going to perform for me? Oh, my gosh. You see, we have this wrong definition of what love is. And so kids end up thinking in this culture that we live in that, that love is some kind of giving and sometimes performing. And they end up becoming scarred by having multiple sexual partners because they think I've got to prove my love to this person that somehow that's the way we're going to show our love. And if that's the way I show our love, I've got to give the right gifts and I've got to give the right performance. And then maybe they'll know that I love them. But the problem is that it has nothing to do with love. 
See, we desperately have to define what love is if we want to help people understand that God is love. We've got to define what is love. Scripture gives us an understanding of this in Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, is probably the best definition of love in the Scripture. And I want you to get this. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 28, says it this way. In the same way, husbands ought to do what? Love their wives as they love their own bodies. Some of us are in trouble already. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. Because no one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for his church. Uh-oh, the picture we have of love here is it's not gifts and it's not performance that there's a standard. And the standard we see, we see here in Ephesians 5, he says, hey, if you're going to be able to love your spouse, you've got to first be able to love yourself. Oh, pastor, that doesn't sound biblical. That's not what we've been taught because loving yourself is wrong. No, I think the problem is we'll never reach our highest and best form of who God created us to be. I love that song that they sang today. Yes, I know who I am because of who Christ says that I am. That he didn't call you to be defeated. He didn't call you to be destroyed. He called you to life. And you're never going to become who God wants you to be until you figure these things out. And part of it is learning to love yourself. Uh-oh, I'm messing with somebody's theology. That's really good because I love doing that. Matthew 22 says it this way. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Who responds? Jesus. Who sets the standard for us? Jesus. Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. This is it. This is the back daddy commandment right here. First and greatest one. Watch this though. In verse number 39, a second is what? Equally. Equally. Well, this is the big one. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And here's the next one. And this is just as big, Jesus says. It's equal. That you must love your neighbor as your... Hold on a minute. I'm supposed to have this definition of love because I've got to live it out in my life. And the way that I'm going to live it out in my life is I have to love my family like I love myself and I have to love my neighbor like I love myself. But the problem is I don't know what that even means. I don't understand what that means. And I think one six-year-old girl, when she heard that passage read, she kind of put it all really in the best. Here's what she said when she heard this teaching about that you've got to love your neighbor as yourself. She said, if you don't love yourself, then your neighbor really has problems. Because if you can't love yourself, how can you love your neighbor? Hmm, We're headed somewhere today. This is huge. Being able to actually not loathe yourself. We're living in a generation that loathes themselves enough. They're trying to change who they are. They're trying to find out a different way to express who they are. They're trying to figure out a difference in life because they loathe themselves so much. We have, we have a generation that's cutting themselves, that, are, that suicide is running rampant. They loathe themselves so much. Why? Because they don't have a clear definition of what love really is. This is so important that I I want you to understand. I'm going to tell you, if you're single today, I want you to listen to what I'm trying to tell you. You should never marry someone who doesn't love themselves. Some of you are going, oh my gosh, you just told me to to marry somebody who's conceited. That's not what I said. Because here's, here's what's important. The standard that we love by is how we love ourselves. And if I hate myself, I'll end up hating the people in close relationship with. And if I don't know how to care for myself, then I won't know how to care for those close to me. Now that little lady right there and I have been married for 28 years this coming June, and, and I, I'm just so thankful she hadn't come to her senses yet. Do you know what? It took me to about 10 years in our marriage to realize she was not me. I know I'm slow, but it's worth, I'm worth waiting on. The reality was I hold myself to a different standard and because I hold myself to that standard I was holding her to that standard and it was becoming a division between us because everybody else might fail and everybody else might let me down but I'm not going to do it my family better not do it 
And I had this mis mixed up concept of what love was because love was gifts and performance and, and love was measuring up to this standard that other people couldn't measure up to. And, and, and it brought me to this place because I could not let myself stumble. I could not let myself be imperfect. And I was pushing her further away because I didn't know how to love her because I was loving her the way that I loved myself and it was causing a division. See, I may not be shouting this morning, but I'm teaching you something. I'm giving you something. And you should never allow yourself to get too close to someone who loathes themselves because in that moment what you're going to realize is they'll end up, that'll end up being poured onto you. Now I know what you're saying, some of you that are students of the scripture, you're going, Pastor Don, you're misunderstanding what you're trying to say today. You're misunderstanding this teaching because it's not possible to really love yourself because doesn't the Bible warn against loving yourself? And the problem is, yes, the Bible does get warned against loving yourself, but it's an English translation. It's not an actual uh, verbiage that was used in the beginning. You see, over in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 2, this, this, this word uh, is used again. It says, for people will love, watch this, only themselves. People will love who? Only themselves. Not that they will love themselves, but they'll love only themselves and their money, and they will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. Now, here's a problem. The word that is used for love is actually translated differently as a different word here than is translated earlier in the Ephesians chapter 5. And the word that is translated for love here, not that it, it maybe seems that important to you, but I want to give you this teaching today, is philatos. And so when I realized that the word love used here in 2 Timothy 3, 2 is philatos, I want you to understand uh, something about that. Let's look at that word together. And I think the best way to understand that today is I'm going to put it in a phrase in a way that you can understand it. I'm going to call it Phil's autos. How many of you just felt like we just went into a used car commercial? <laughs> Phil's autos. Watch this. Let's break the word apart. Phil. Philos which means friendship, friendship, auto, self, okay, friendship, self, what I have is I love myself above everyone else, now that's a problem, because that is not the kind of love that Christ gave us as an example, just so you'll understand this a little more, this autos has a very singular phrasing to it. When they were trying to decide about a vehicle that was driven by a singular driver, they called it an automobile, one driver. When they were trying to create this word about one signer, it's called a, a, a autos graphos. Autos graphos means to, graphos means to write or to mark. Autos uh, means singular. Autos graphos means one signer. Autonomous, someone who can stand on their own according to the law, someone who stands by themselves. See, what we're seeing here is a different use of the word love. Here in this passage, this is the kind of love that, that Jude described in Jude 1.18 that said in the last days that there would be times that there would be scoffers, people in this life who would only live to satisfy their own fleshly desires. Is what was described in 2 Peter chapter 3 when it was most importantly I want to remind you that in the last days there will be scoffers mocking the truth and following after everything they want. They're philatos. They'll only want to take care of themselves. And so that's the problem. We get this concept to think it's that to love myself means it's only about myself. But that's not the kind of love that was described in Ephesians chapter 5. That's not the kind of love that God wants us to live by that will define love for us. The word that there, and if you've been to church ever many times in your life, you've probably heard this word and you went, amen, and you didn't even know what it meant, and it's agape. The kind of love that was mentioned in Ephesians chapter 5 is agape. And agape means a selfless expression so the scripture says that i'm supposed to agape others the way i agape myself how does that work what does that mean how do i how do i treat them the way i treat myself in this example and i think the best example of this comes from a really weird place but it's the best way to show an agape moment here i want you to get this today an agape moment can be found when you get on an airplane. How many of you have ever flown on an airplane? Let me see your hands. What's the first thing that happens when you get on an airplane? You go in, you find your seat, you check to make sure you know where the exit is. Not that it's going to do you any good, but you want to know where it is. And then I make sure there's a barf bag right in front of me. I'm, you, you apparently never ridden anywhere with me. I make sure there's one there. 
I put my seatbelt on, get it all situated, and then right before we take off, the flight crew takes the center aisle, and they get the little seatbelts, and they say, in case you're having trouble belking, uh, buckling your seatbelt, this is how it works. I'm thinking, if you're having trouble with that, we've got a real problem. <laughs> Don't be in an exit aisle. And the next thing that happens is pretty interesting. The next thing that happens is what? They, set, they lift up this mask. And when they lift up this mask, and it, they let it fall, and they say, in case of a loss of cabin pressure, that oxygen masses, mask will fall. And then they say, and if you have a miner with you, do what? Do what? Agape yourself first. Interesting. Agape yourself first. Now, how many of you know that goes against everything that we, we feel like love is? To agape myself first, it means this. What? It means that I have to take that and put it on myself because until I put it on myself, I'm not capable of doing what they need. But here's what happens. Do you know how more children die and adults die in those type situations? The adult doesn't agape themselves first. The adult goes and reaches over. And all I can imagine is my two-year-old grandson. Look, if I'm on a plane with my two-year-old grandson, on a good day, it is going to be chaos. But just imagine for just a moment. The plane shakes violently. The air masks drop and people begin to scream. And I grab that mask and I put it on my two-year-old grandson. I'm turning for me to put mine on. And what is he going to do? Yank it off. Why? Because he's scared. He doesn't know what he's doing. So what am I going to do? I'm going to put it back on him because I'm willing to die for him so that he can live I'm gonna put it back on him and the problem is then what's he gonna do again yank it off what's gonna happen next we're gonna die both of us both of us are going to die why because when I pass out there's nobody to take care of him because I didn't agape myself first I could not agape him because the reality what I have to do is put on the mask and when I have the mask on I grab that little turkey uh, turkey and I pull him over there and I put that thing on him and pray he passes out <laughs> come on now why because I'm gonna make sure he has what he needs but I cannot give him what he needs until I figured out how to get what I need and that's what the scriptures really trying to talk about here the scriptures telling me until I get myself in the right place with love I can never get in the right place with others in love because if you can't love yourself you'll never be able to truly express love for others and Ephesians 5 29 says this for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes somebody who goes, yes, I've hated my own flesh, then you're who I'm talking to because you don't know how to love yourself. But they nourish it and they cherish it just as Christ also does the church. See, the teaching here is solid. It's biblical. You've got to learn how to get yourself taken care of so that you can change others. Most of us just so desperately want to see our families better. The thing that people come to me and go, Pastor, my family's falling apart. Tell me how to fix my family. I say, get well yourself. Right. Pastor Don, that's not going to fix my marriage. I said, I don't know if there's hope for your marriage, but what I do know is if you don't fix yourself, you're going to end up right back in the same spot. And that's what the Scripture's saying, that God wants to help you learn to agape yourself so that you can understand His agape nature for no one ever hated his own flesh but he nourishes it and he cherishes it just as Christ does the church I'm gonna hurry I'm gonna close here stay with me to love means to nourish and to cherish to love means to nourish and to cherish according to Ephesians chapter 5 to agape means that I'm going to nourish something that means I'm going to bring it to maturity that if I really 
really agape something, I really, really love something, I'm going to do whatever it takes to protect it so that it can grow and become what it needs to be. And remember what I told you earlier on, some of you feel like God doesn't love you because it seems sometimes like God is doing stuff that doesn't really fit with your schedule and your plan for your life, and if you really love me, you'd accept me the way I am, and all of that stuff, and what God's saying, and no, 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 you don't understand. I see all the junk that came into you through all the generations of upbringing, but now I'm going to put a protection around you that's going to nourish you. And I'm going to help you become mature because I cherish you. And to cherish means to care for and protect. Wow. To care for and protect. That if I really want to honor God, then I'm going to understand that to get an understanding of love, that I have to understand it means to nourish, which means to provide, provide the right atmosphere, and to cherish, to protect from anything that will prevent maturity. This is so important. Get this, or I'll miss everything I've said to you. That I believe that I want to get to a place to where I'm protected and, and, and I, am, I am provided for so that I can become the best that God's called me to be because love is defined as protecting and providing. Love means to protect and to provide. Why is this important? What does this have to do with anything? Why did God put you here to hear this today? If the Bible is true and God orders the footsteps of the righteous, he wanted you to hear this sermon. Why did God do that? Here's why. Because you can't offer what you can't define. If you don't know what it is, how do you give it? How do you give it? If you don't know what true love is, how can you meet the standard? How can you go from gifts and performance how can you go from those places to where you feel like, do you realize in the United States of America, it's not one out of every 100 that will end up with diseases that are sexually transmitted. It's not one out of 50 in our young people. It's not one out of 20 in our young people. It is one out of every two that will end up with some kind of a disease that, that, that will get because they're trying to find love in all the wrong places. Because they don't know how to define what true love is. So the next time that you're in a relationship and somebody looks and says, if you love me, you will, you'll have to understand that's not what real love is. Real love doesn't make a demand out of me that might put my life in danger. Real love makes a demand out of me that says, I'm going to protect you and I'm going to provide for you and I'm going to make sure what's best for you happens in your life. That's what real love is. Some of you are desperately crying out, why does nobody love me? The, the thing is, God does love you. God has protected and provided for you. And you're going, but pastor, you don't understand the bad things that have happened in my life. God doesn't want to take you from where you were. He wants to take you from where you are right now. And he wants to say, look, I know that bad things have happened in your life, but I can protect you. I can provide for you from right where you are and help you begin to grow and mature. And what the devil thought would destroy you and that would always mess your mind up and make you a victim your whole life, no longer will become what defines you but the fact that God was your protector and his, your provider he will define you stand with me if you would today I got like four minutes trust me I can preach all four of them God is love God is your protector God is your provider God of course you right where you are Let's get these guys in place, and I want to talk to everybody in this room. Everybody that's here. Pastor Don, you just want us to believe the way you believe. Can I just tell you, yes? I do. It's okay to disagree about a lot of things in life, but there's one thing that matters above all, is that God loves you enough. This is real love, that God sent his only son. This is real protection. This is real provision that God sent his son to die for us. That everything that scarred us might not be able to keep, hold us down. And every ounce of pain and every ounce of performance and every ounce of struggles might not be able to keep us back because God in his goodness provided for us. I want you to bow your heads all over this place. On the stage, all over this place, everybody bow your heads. I want every head bowed, every eye closed for just... This is the most important thing about this day. This is it. I want to ask you a series of questions. I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but I want to ask you a series of questions. Let me ask you today, who here, this is really, really simple, 
really wants to be loved. Can I see your hand if that's you? You really want to be loved all over this place. Hold it up, hold it up, hold it up. You just want to be loved. Majority of people in this room, put those hands down. You going, Pastor? I want to be loved, but I, I've never really seen what true love is. I've not known how to give true love. I've never really seen what love can be. But today I want to see it. If that's you, let me see your hands right where you are. Hold them up high. Hold them up high. I'm looking all across the stage, all around this room. Everybody praying with me. I don't need anybody's help. The people all over this place. Thank you. Put those hands down. Now for the biggest question of all most important moment this is it this is the moment God is love God is your protector and your provider God brought you here today and you, you, you didn't know why you were even coming but he brought you here today so that you might meet the protector and the provider so that you might have a new standard of what love is not one that walks out on you and not one that beats you down but one that protects you Provides for you and holds you up. If that's you, and you say today, Pastor, I'm ready for a new standard. I want to either give my life to Jesus Christ or recommit my life to Jesus Christ so that I can know God's love in the fullness because that's what love is, Jesus. And whether you're here, whether you're watching, whether you're listening, I'm talking to everyone, this is it. This is the moment. This is, this is eternity's moment right here. And you would say, Pastor, today's the day I want to surrender my life completely to the love of God. I want to know Jesus as my Savior. If that's you, let me see your hand right where you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hold them up. Thank you. Thank you. Where are you? I'm waiting on any more. Hold them up. Hold them up. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Put those hands down. The Bible says that if we will confess Jesus Christ as Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we would be born again. And so today, the way we're going to embrace his love is by confessing our need for our Savior and receiving his grace. And then everything's going to change in our lives. I want to pray for all who've responded today, but I want to pray for these six or seven who've responded in this service, along with the six or seven who responded in the last service. This is the day. This is the moment. We're going to pray a prayer. I want everybody in this room to collectively lift your voices and pray with me. If you're watching, pray right there where you are. If you're listening, pray right where you are. Let's pray together now. Jesus, Jesus. by faith, by faith. I, believe I believe your promises. Your promises. Heavenly, Father, Heavenly Father, I am a sinner, am a sinner. In, need of a in need of a Savior. In Jesus' name, Jesus name. I, receive I receive your love your grace become my protector and my provider from this moment forward I give you my everything in Jesus name I believe that God is my father heaven is my home and Jesus is my Savior father I thank you for those that prayed that some for the very first time today I thank you for your grace and your goodness and your favor that has chased us. And now for those who are saying they've got a mixed up concept of what love is, I thank you, Lord, now with a better definition that they will protect and provide those for those around them like they protect and provide for themselves like you have protected and provided for us as the ultimate standard. Lord, love is going to begin to permeate their lives. And as love does that, the presence of the Holy Spirit is going to bring forth good harvest for them. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Come on, give God a praise today.